I can say without a doubt in my mind that The Angry Beavers is a classic staple in the lineup of 90s Nicktoons. It's a show that in a lot of ways embodies what made 90s Nick so great. I always appreciated the back and forth between Norb and Dag, being that though they are brothers, they were overall opposite personalities that clashed a ton. I'm also a sucker for the color palette of the opening sequence. I remember being a young child and as soon as I saw that opening and heard the theme music, I was immediately sucked in. In my opinion, if there was a Mount Rushmore of 90s Nicktoons, either Norb or Dag would definitely have to be immortalized on it. Though it did come later in the lineup of 90s Nicktoons, having premiered in April of 1997 and ended in June of 2001, the show still left its mark on the history of how 90s Nicktoons were perceived. If you were a kid in the 90s or early 2000s, odds are you watched this show and enjoyed it to some capacity. I know I did. That's why today we're taking a look at my top 5 most iconic episodes of The Angry Beavers. As always, if there's an episode that you think should have been included in this list that wasn't included, then leave me a comment down below. Odds are, I'll end up making a sequel to this video someday, and I always take note of the episodes that you guys request down in the comments. If you enjoy this video, then leave a like so more people can see it, and if you aren't subscribed yet, then subscribe for more videos just like this one. I'm on the road to a thousand subscribers, and I would appreciate you being a part of the journey. And with that being said, let's venture out to the forest near way out of town Oregon for our nostalgic walk down memory lane. Number 5. Guess Who's Stumping to Dinner? This episode from season 2 begins with Norb in front of the TV watching the start of a horror movie, Curse of the Mummy's Curse. Meanwhile, Dag is in the kitchen struggling to make some popcorn. As Dag comes back to watch the movie, he lands ass first on the pointy wooden head of Norb's new friend, Stump. Dag gets offended at the fact that Stump is in his spot on the couch, and he begins to question Norb's mental state, which quickly leads to them butting heads. They decide to resolve the situation with a good old fashioned thumb wrestling match. <laughs> But as they're doing that, we hear a door shut and a car start as they look over to see that Stump has left. As Norb leaves to follow Stump, Dag decides to watch the movie by himself. He gets startled when he hears Norb yelling from upstairs. Help! 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 It's after me! I'm coming! I'm coming! I'm coming! It turns out that Norb is actually upstairs practicing some shadow puppets that Stump showed him. Turns out that Stump is actually really good at shadow puppets for someone with no hands. Dag gets jealous and wants Stump to leave, but instead, Norb decides that they're gonna do some of the other cool stuff that Stump has planned. First on the agenda is hang gliding, which Stump is also really good at for someone who has no hands. Dag decides that instead, he's gonna go cliff diving with his new friend Rock. One thing that always cracked me up as a kid was how in this scene when Dag wears those shorts, they are their own stationary entity. When he moves, the shorts do not, and for some reason that always cracked me up, and it still does to this day. Expert hang glider Stump flies by and knocks Dag off of the cliff and into a river down below. Next, they go for some high speed downhill luge. Let me go first! <laughs> Dag tries to ruin the fun by mailing Stump to the South Pole in a giant box, but he gets tricked by Stump and Dag himself ends up getting sent to the South Pole instead. Dag gets back from the South Pole just in time for some interdimensional travel courtesy of Scientist Stump. Stump, this is truly amazing. If your theory is correct, an ordinary doorway in our dam will become a doorway to another dimension! Stump bravely offers to go first through the portal, so Norb ties a rope around him and anchors it in their dimension. Dag sees this as the perfect opportunity to send Stump away. He unties the rope and attempts to push Stump through the portal, but he trips and ends up going through the portal himself. Thankfully, Stump has the other end of the rope, so Dag is able to pull himself back through the portal. Norb catches onto the plot that Dag had tried to pull. You were trying to push Stump through the doorway to another dimension! Duh. Being fed up with Dag's insecurity, Norb leaves, facing a stormy night complete with thunder and lightning. After sitting down on the couch, Dag looks over to see Stump, who has Norb plus Dag forever carved into his back, and he starts to feel bad for pushing his brother away. He realizes that his overactive jealousy is what pushed Norb away, and he goes out into the night to find Norb. They make up, and then we see the three of them playing a game outside together. Naturally, Dag being a sore loser, he gets all butthurt about Stump winning the game, and that leads to him and Norb arguing again. I thought you weren't gonna call him 
stupid stump anymore. I lied. You promised. I did that not. That man saved your life. He did not. You're walking around with a stone. He, he, your he best was honest. friend was a he was stone. Loyal. He was my best friend. Number four, Gift Horse. This season 1 episode is a personal favorite of mine. It revolves around the brothers celebrating Arbor Day, which is basically Christmas for beavers. Dag wakes up bright and early as he drags Norb out of bed to go open presents. Dag is literally giddy as a child opening presents on Christmas morning. The doorbell rings and they go downstairs to answer it. I got it. I got it. I got it. No, I got no, it. No, you got it last time. I got it. No, no, it's no, 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 I got it. Got it. Hamming oh. What's in the pink salad? Grandma's corn. The mailman delivers two gigantic packages from their parents for Arbor Day. Norb, being four minutes older, gets to open his present first, as per beaver tradition of course. He carefully peels back the wrapping paper to find a Paul Bunyan Giant Loggers Express electric train set, which he is just in awe of. Dag rapidly and excitedly rips off the wrapping paper from his gift to unveil a little tiny tree-shaped air freshener. Norb offers very graciously and kind of pretentiously to trade, but Dag refuses uses, saying sadly that it's what he's always wanted. While Norb is busy enjoying his super cool train set, Dag tries to enjoy his tree air freshener by playing muscular beaver with secret powers and playing army. All the meanwhile, his resentment for Norb is building by the second. He imagines himself getting rid of his brother, the train, and the pine tree as he concocts a devilish plot. Unfortunately for Dag, he has terrible luck and all of his plots seem to not go his way. He gets dropped down a hole with one of the trains he derails, he gets caught in the middle of an 11 train car pileup, and he goes on a wild ride via a grappling hook that gets stuck to one of the trains and he completely destroys Norbert's entire train set. As the brothers are sitting in the rubble, of what used to be Norb's train set, they hear the doorbell ring as the mailman delivers another package. He needed to make two trips because the second present was way too large. Turns out that the air freshener was for a giant remote control monster truck that was supposed to be for Dag. Just goes to show that things aren't always what they seem. Hey pal, don't even think about it. Number 3, Beaver Fever. This season 1 episode begins with all of the forest animals having a dance party late at night, with music provided by Norb and Dag singing and playing makeshift instruments. Things go sideways, which results in the beavers in a bush thumb wrestling their problems away like they always do. Then a guy named Ted Browman shows up, claiming that he will make them disco stars. Next thing you know, we see a glimpse into the big city plastered with beaver fever ads and billboards. The beavers record their debut album, titled The Bark Album, in a studio, and during production, the album goes platinum. Ted Browman tells them that he's got them booked for Disco-rama. Disco-rama! The, the most kitschy boss roof bang on the tune! They perform their hit song Beaver Fever on the show, and might I add, I still get this song stuck in my head more than like 20 years later. Got the beaver fever. Beep, beep, beaver fever. The beavers end up having a press conference in bed in their jammies, which is a reference to John Lennon from the Beatles holding a press conference from his bed with Yoko Ono to promote peace. During the conference, Dag says they're bigger than sliced bread, which results in the beavers getting cancelled by sliced bread fans. After their quick, brutal cancellation, Ted Brownman tells them that it's time for them to write their next disco hit, unapologetically reminding them that almost every single disco act is a one-hit wonder. The beavers end up butting heads over who wrote Beaver Fever, and they let their fame get to their heads. Hey, lawyerly guy, ask Spoothead if he's thought of anything yet. Mr. Daggett wants to know if Mr. Norbert's come up with anything yet. Dallas. <laughs> Mr. Daggett wants to know if you've come up with anything. Just when they decide they're going to pursue separate solo careers, the owner of the record label shows up and reminds them that in their contract, it says that if they don't deliver another hit, that he gets all of their horror movies and footy pajamas. Naturally, they don't deliver, considering their next hit is called More Beaver Fever and is basically the same song. So their movies and pajamas get confiscated, and the episode ends with Barry becoming the next big disco star. Oh, 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 baby. Oh, baby. 
partner. Hey, 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 wait a minute. Hey, hey. hey. what was that whole hey. brother hey. rap hey. for? Hey. Hey. You just I'm going solo, 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 solo. Number two, Bummer of Love. This episode from season one begins with the beavers being woken up by the sound of construction outside. They find out that their pond is being used for a music festival and the big lug of a security guard throws them out of their own pond because they don't have backstage passes. Dag comes up with a plan to sneak in that involves Norb causing a diversion, but Norb gets distracted when he meets a girl who he is immediately smitten with. Hi. Hi. My name's Tree Flower. Hi. <laughs> Do you have a name? Yeah. While Dag is trying to push the gates, Norb sneaks in with Tree Flower and her friends. Norb and Tree Flower seem to be quickly falling in love as they share a romantic moment under some fireworks while they have some stuffed jalapenos together. Tree Flower tells Norb that she is in a band called the Friendly Chartreuse Bubblegum Machine. Norb asks to hear them play, and the two fall into a music-induced psychedelic trip that looks just like something my grandparents probably experienced at Woodstock back in the 1960s. And he said, yes he said, I think I like you. Norb convinces the friendly chartreuse bubblegum machine that they should play the festival, and he sneaks them to the stage by swimming underwater. They start playing as Norb declares that this is now a free concert, which causes a stampede of people outside to rush the gates. Oh yeah, I should probably point out that Dag has been trying unsuccessfully to get into the festival this entire time, but the rushing crowd drags him in with them. Dag makes it onto the stage, and like a strange miracle, the brothers end up playing with Tree Flower's band, which is a massive success. The episode ends with the brothers waking up the next morning, and just as quickly as it all showed up, the stage and entire festival is gone. Dear Norb, it was really psychedelic sharing the groove with you and your strange brother. <sighs> hey, she dumped you, huh? She'll always be here in spirit. She dumped you. She dumped you. 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 Number one, the day the world got really screwed up. This double length season two episode completely parodies B movies and sci fi as a whole. In the beginning, we see this strange orb crash land on Earth behind a fancy looking house. A guy stumbles upon it and it zaps him, seeming to lure him into its control. Yes, Master. Next, we see another guy getting carried into an ambulance on a stretcher while he is having a laughing fit. He's laughing uncontrollably at two beavers who are out trick-or-treating on the wrong day. Those two beavers, of course, would be Norb and Dag. Norb dresses up as his favorite bee actor, Oxnard Montalvo, and Dag dresses up as a crawling spleen. They end up trick-or-treating the spookiest house in the neighborhood, which turns out to be the home of none other than Oxnard Montalvo himself. Naturally, this ends up being the exact same house from the beginning of the episode, where the mysterious orb crash landed. They go inside in hopes of meeting Oxnard and getting some candy, but no one can be found. Inside the house, they end up meeting Oxnard's manservant, Man Cervante, who is the guy who we saw get zapped by the orb in the beginning. I have never felt such feelings of reality. Such powers must be mine. Yes, all powerful one. He tries to zap Norbert and Dagget unsuccessfully as Dag accidentally hits him in the nuts and sends him flying down a flight of stairs. We end up seeing Man Cervante approach one of the biggest props in the house and zapping it as he commands it to destroy the humans and bring back the pointy animals. Meanwhile, Norb and Dag meet Oxnard and his group. Shortly after, the giant prop shows up to destroy them, but it steps on Dag's tail, causing him to go absolutely berserk. Look out! The little fellow's gone berserk! 
With the golem defeated, we see the orb in the backyard start to change as it bursts into a green slime. The scientist of Oxnard's group explains that the alien that crashed in the backyard is feeding off of their thoughts and using them to get stronger and feed on their reality. The alien continues to change form as it gets larger and stronger by the second. The power of the alien causes their reality to turn black and white, just like an old B-movie, except for Norb and Dag, who seem to be unaffected by it. It also causes all of the B-movie prop monsters to come to life and attack. Norb and Dag make a run for it, but they quickly realize that they aren't any safer outside of the house than they are inside of it. Then, Man Cervantes shows up to explain that the alien keeps getting bigger and stronger because it's feeding off of Norbert and Daggett's overactive imaginations. The beavers meet back up with Oxnard and his group, and they get cornered by Man Cervantes. Thankfully, the doctor gives Oxnard the idea to hit him with the mindulator thingy. Quickly, Oxnard! Hit him with a mindulator thingy! Take this! Is it just me? Or was that the stupidest thing we've ever seen? With Mon Cervante defeated, the alien continues to grow stronger, and it rips a giant hole in the ground, sending the beavers down below with the mindulator thingy. They have an epic battle, the alien and its living monsters versus the beavers. The battle culminates in the beavers launching the mindulator thingy at the alien, which completely defeats it and restores color back to the world, and turns all the monsters back into props. With all being restored back to normal, the actors conclude their adventure with a cheesy B-movie style monologue that results in the revelation that Man Cervante never actually existed to begin with. Finally, with everything as it should be, the beavers get to continue their night of trick-or-treating on the wrong day. I don't get you anymore, though, because I want the candy! The candy! The candy! The candy. <laughs> and so reality became reality once again, thanks to two of nature's humblest and densest semi-aquatic mammals. Hey! The alien object had become a victim of its own story. A story that made absolutely no sense. I mean, for instance, if the alien could bring the monster statues to life through that manservant guy, why did it need the beavers? I mean, beavers can't even talk and be... Thank you very much for taking this nostalgic trip down memory lane with me. Again, if you enjoyed this video, then click that like button so more people get to see it. Subscribe to my channel for more awesome videos like this one. I'm on the road to a thousand subs, and I would appreciate you being a part of my journey there. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.